All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the, uh, to the last session of reInvent before the, before the party or before you break for dinner. Uh, my name is Julian Dunn. I'm a principal product marketing manager at PagerDuty. Um, and this is Mark Huber from Cox Automotive. I'll let Mark introduce himself in a minute. How many of you folks are familiar with PagerDuty? Oh, that's a good, sizable crowd. How many of you folks are on call right now? All right. So if I see you rush out the door with an anguished or look on your face, I'll know why. Uh, feel free to have, do that if you have to. Um, for those who aren't familiar with PagerDuty, um, we are a platform for managing your real-time digital operations. And we're a pure SaaS. Uh, we were founded in 2009, really as, just as the cloud was really starting to take off. And what we do is we focus on helping you get control of what we call unplanned or emergent work. So these are things that maybe are not like tickets that you've planned, projects that you've worked on, but things that might happen as you transform your organizations into becoming digital first. And that often involves adopting the cloud. That's obviously why many of you are here at this conference uh, this week. And that's why we're here at reInvent as well. So as I mentioned before, you know, emergent work is really anything that's happening in your, in your digital systems that, ne that is negatively impacting customers, and therefore that you need to investigate and resolve uh, with a high degree of urgency. So this could be anything as clear cut as, of course, a, a server being down or an application being slow. But sometimes issues, especially in the cloud, they're not as obvious. Um, because in the cloud, you've heard many of the announcements this week. You know, Amazon has hundreds of services. With that huge amount of complexity, it's often not really clear uh, what's actually going on. Signals about things that are going wrong are potentially coming from all over the place. Uh, often those signals can duplicate one another, so you can think about if you have something that's a widespread outage, right? Your server monitoring might be going off, your application monitoring might be going off. Those things are related, Sometimes it's not immediately apparent that those things are related. Um, so it's really hard to separate what's important from what's not when all alarm bells are going off. Uh, and then also when you figure out that it is important, who's actually responsible for it, especially in a world where you have distributed application teams, right, microservice kind of architectures, and often if you don't know what, who, who's actually responsible for it and you're not able to route that problem to the right team, then you're wasting a lot of time scrambling, there's customer impact involved while you're trying to sort out who's actually gonna deal with that issue and meanwhile you're losing money or your brand reputation is, is going down or, or uh, associated negative effects like that. So, just really quickly, how PagerDuty works um, is uh, it takes in all kinds of signals about your applications and servers and other infrastructure, as I was mentioning before, and, how, and so on, how they're performing. And then what we do is we consolidate and deduplicate that data uh, using a combination of machine learning and rules that you set up. And that machine learning not only takes into account the data that you're sending into the system, but also actions that you're taking as you use the PagerDuty product. Um, and we use this data to basically help you figure out the, the uh, seriousness or the severity of your problem. And if it is really urgent, uh, to basically be able to route that issue to the team or the person who's most capable of uh, dealing with it, that we think is the most capable of dealing with it based on all that stuff that you've set up and, and that, it's, uh, that you've used. So the objective is to really remove uh, you sitting, these sorts of issues, sitting in queues, right, ticket queues for somebody to go and look at them on a help desk. You know, we heard from one of our uh, customers that the world is moving so quickly that have these kinds of issues sit in queues where there's like a level one one, level two, level three, triage, and there's an SLA with each of these, these levels, and each of those SLAs might be 10 or 15 minutes. Like, if there's something seriously burning down, that's just too slow. They can't tolerate that kind of a, a outage while they're waiting around in a queue, right? So identify the person or team that's most uh, capable of handling the issue, and they might hand it off to somebody else or escalate it or whatever, but you want somebody that is close to understanding what that application is or what that problem is to be working on it right away. Um, and then finally, the thing is that all these actions that you're taking in the system, it's a feedback loop. So any of the actions that you take in PagerDuty, they're ingested back into the system with the overall objective of helping, helping you to A, refine those machine learning algorithms, and B, to be able to help you understand and analyze how your digital operations are going. So that's PagerDuty in a nutshell. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it off to Mark, and Mark is gonna talk a little bit about who Cox Automotive is, that maybe is not necessarily a brand name that you folks know, but you probably heard of some of the companies that Cox Automotive owns, um, and so I'll just give it over to Mark. All right, thanks a lot. So, like you said, Cox Automotive may not be a name that you know in the industry, 
Uh, you may have heard of some of our sister companies like Cox Media Group or Cox Communications. Um, Cox Automotive is a, is a relatively new part of the Cox family. Um, but in that time, uh, we have uh, been a part of three out of every four car purchases in North America. We cover everything in the automotive industry from the inventory on dealer lots, dealer websites and advertising, the financing that happens behind the scenes, uh, the service that happens when you need service on your car or fleets need servicing. And we're looking into the new ways that people buy and sell uh, vehicles in the industry. And even beyond just buying and selling, we know that there are new models and new ways that people are looking at how they interact with vehicles, maybe not just buying and selling them. Uh, we look at what's happening in the, in the rideshare space, what's happening in the subscription and leasing space. And we want to be a part of making that industry move. Um, and one way to look at you know, who is Cox Automotive is to look at the history. Um, Cox as a whole has been around a little bit longer than the cloud, um, over 100 years. Cox Automotive really started its origins from the Mannheim space with wholesale auto auctions. And these are physical auction lots, like you see uh, cars driving through lanes and people placing bids on cars, dozens and dozens of locations around the country. Um, and this is a you know, full-time activity. Uh, we treat the physical operations at those sites just like we treat the monitoring and for our software applications. Here are things like AutoTrader. They uh, have been a key part of the automotive industry. Um, KBB.com, and then a lot of other brands that build software that power what you see when you go into a dealership to shop for cars. Um, everything to even things like ready auto transport, how cars get moved around the country. You see these car haulers going down the freeway. A lot of times it's a, uh, about um, helping dealers get these cars moved around so that they can optimize their inventory across the country. Um, in 2014, all of these came together in the Cox family to form Cox Automotive, and we kept building and building. But that history uh, makes us a real interesting part of this conversation, which is we were many, many engineering teams that have come together into the Cox Automotive engineering team. And the more we have come together, the more that we found communication is key and challenging at the same time. Um, we are 27 different brands. We are in 53 different data centers. Um, and we're over 2,000 strong in our engineering organization. That turns into about 350 scrum teams across those brands in 30 different locations. Um, we have every tech stack under the sun, like a lot of enterprises do. Um, and we have a lot of diversity in our skills, our cultures, our thoughts on engineering, and our approaches. Um, and really, as we came together as Cox Automotive, it became important to start sharing and to start thinking about how do we operate more as uh, you know, a unique share, you know, universal engineering organization that puts together the best of the breeds here and, and helps them to um, interoperate, to share technology, to share ideas. And, you know, the diversity gives us strength, but the diversity also presents its challenges in bringing all these technologies together. In 2018, we announced that we were an all-in with AWS company, and that was a catalyst for us. Um, but the journey did start before that. Um, we've been in our cloud journey for probably about four and a half to five years now. Um, and when we decided to uh, go all in with AWS, a big part of that strategy was ex exiting those 53 data centers, um, but really not just about a, a dollars game with exiting data centers. It was about um, creating commonality and leverage and collaboration amongst all these diverse engineering teams. Um, and so sort of the, the horizontal of that, or, of, uh, of that decision was um, forming what we call the cloud business office. Uh, that's sort of our program management of moving out of those data centers. And what we saw was a key deciding factor in how well uh, we succeeded at that objective was really the skill and uh, tools and the ability of our engineering teams. And so my organization is called Engineering Enablement. And our mission is to provide teams uh, everything they need to be successful. And that's everything from 
you know, what you might call traditional like cloud operations or cloud center of excellence, um, where we actually provide the AWS account factory and access to tools like um, you know, GitHub and New Relic and PagerDuty. Um, and all of these uh, common uh, approaches that teams can leverage to you know, go after their objectives and have a common you know, layer of communication. Um, AWS is at the, as sort of at the foundation of that and we've built on top of that and really started to revitalize the, the way that engineering teams can collaborate with each other. So. Great. So Mark, could you talk a little bit about um, you know, you mentioned you started from a point of having these 53 data centers. Like, what was the kind of business reason or the thought behind moving to the cloud? And, you know, how did that initially start? Um, how did that process start? So, I mean, as, as, as the industry is looking for solutions that are the full life cycle of, uh, of what happens in the automotive transaction, right? Not just from, you know, buying the car, but even owning the car and eventually selling the car and moving on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, we saw that we had uh, all the different parts of that journey, but not connected together. And so we needed to start uh, allowing engineering teams to collaborate on features, uh, to depend on each other for services, uh, and that means connectivity. That means um, you know, trying to bring these 53 different data centers that weren't part of an initial strategy, um, bring them together, uh, and what we saw was that um, the levels of overhead were non-differentiated heavy lifting for us, right? And so we, see, we saw the, the, the first order of working together was to be able to communicate with each other. Um, and so by having a strategy where we have the cohesive ability within AWS for teams to call out to other services from other teams um, across different AWS accounts, um, the AWS provided that common backplane of communication, um, and it also provided a common language of interaction for these teams, right? They may not be on the same uh, programming language or using the same frameworks, but you know, we can all speak in RESTful APIs, and as long as I can you know, reach your API, then we have an opportunity to build product features together. Mm -hmm. And did you find you already had some groups that were using the cloud in various pockets and things like yeah, that? Yeah, we definitely did. Before, you know, we had uh, a number of teams, um, you know, Mannheim in particular, um, who ventured out into that cloud space uh, and were, you know, their work became the, you know, sort of the foundation for what we saw of, you know, this is how one organization can enable their teams with AWS um, and we're able to, you know, take that out to standardize the offering and allow more teams to come in and take advantage of that. Um, you know, once we had a strong offering in that space, you know, teams were already looking for it, but it also became a huge accelerator in the objectives we had as a business to, um, to consolidate our operations and to become more cohesive in our, in our ability to deliver products. Right, great. All right, so when in that process of adopting the cloud, did you introduce PagerDuty? Like, did that, that, did that also come about from a number of different teams independently using it, or was it sort of more of a top-down approach, or was it a combination of the two? Yeah. Um, to be really honest, uh, it was a grassroots movement, right? Um, so one of, the, one of the key challenges of communication around our organization um, is something that, we, uh, something that we have a team who helps us with called our Enterprise Operations Center. And that, that Operations Center is sort of the, the central nervous system for communication around the organization. Um, and you know, in the early days, you know, teams leveraged PagerDuty to, um, you know, to manage their local incident response, but also to you know, pass that information along to the, to the EOC and uh, to help them create awareness around the organization when an issue is happening to help them transit you know, and reach another team over on another side of the organization that they might need support from, whether that's a shared services team like a networking team or a, another product group. You know, the EOC was that backbone uh, that helped us communicate. But because it started as a grassroots movement, even if two, two teams were using PagerDuty, it didn't mean they were using the same PagerDuty. Right. Right? Um, and the EOC helped us bridge that gap. Um, and that pattern was effective, right? We saw the power that 
that uh, PagerDuty did to enable teams to control their, their incident response process locally, but also create visibility to the EOC. Um, and that's been over the, probably the course of, I'd say, the last uh, probably about four or five years. Here in the last 12 months, um, we started the conversation to say, you know, what would the next step look like, right? And so um, we made the decision to go uh, to bring our EOC into the PagerDuty world. Um, and what that did was still they are the, the central nervous system of, of all that communication. They, they are the subject matter experts of how to reach people. What is, you know, what does this system depend on? How, you know, how do we respond as, a, as an enterprise to support you know, our customers to make sure they have the best experience and make sure we get teams talking as fast as possible? By you know, making PagerDuty the backbone of that, we accelerate their capability to bring people together. Right, great. Um, so what were you kind of doing before you had something like this to, to manage unplanned work before the cloud? I mean, you had situations in the data center where things were gonna be down and you didn't know that they were gonna break. Like, what were you using before? Was it simply this EOC and they were calling out to people? Or what, what, how, did it, how did it come about? Right, so the, the EOC is still, um, you know, is not just a set of tooling, it's a set of people, mm -hmm. right? And uh, regardless of the tool, um, they help broker that communication. Um, they help bring people together, work through problems. Um, the, the tool is an accelerator. The practice is the key. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, where it, where, where it has accelerated us is in the uh, ability for a team to communicate, this is how you reach us, this is who is on call, um, and they own that and they manage that locally. Um, before we had that ability, right, there was, there was just more of that undifferentiated heavy lifting of just um, manually managed rotations, everything from other tools to spreadsheets, mm -hmm. right? To, hey, I know that guy, I know he knows about that thing, right? Let's call him. Never mind that he's on vacation, mm -hmm. right? And so not only is it about more effective and faster communication, it's about you know, taking care of the health of our organization too. Right, it is the um, you know making sure that we get fast and effective uh, resolution to incidents, and that you know that guy that knows about that thing is actually able to go on vacation, right? And that we we learn where those uh, points of uh, bottleneck can be, um, and then we can react as an organization to improve that, to try to make sure we spread that knowledge. Um, and that someone else can step into that role and maybe be supported by that individual until they learn and grow and we no longer have those um, you know, single individuals who are the only one that can fix that problem because we were there and that was something we had to grow through and we still have that problem today. We, haven't, we, haven't, we don't have this figured out. Mm -hmm. um, but we see that the tool enables the thought process and it's the thought process that improves. Right. right? Yeah. So I do want to talk a little bit just about the elements of your cloud adoption journey. And you know, the, 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 as a product marketer, I often see a lot of talks where people are, you know, they're seeing that it's the great story, right? We're in this awesome end state and so on and so forth. But I think folks like to uh, appreciate hearing, you know, what kind of didn't go right the first time and, and how did you address it, right? Is there sort of an order of operations of things that you would do when you're adopting the cloud that you, you know, now in retrospect, you would recommend to folks that are thinking about it? You know, I think that um, there's a couple things. There's a couple things that I feel like were important, and I think in looking back, I feel they're important because I can think of the times when we forgot about them. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, bias to action is important. Right? Uh, you know, we would get into cycles where we would plan and we would plan and we would plan, um, and then we would try to do a big, you know, big bang migration into the mm -hmm. cloud. Um, and that inevitably you know, led to incidents, right? And what we weren't doing was being uh, you know, focused on learning and iterating and moving in small chunks. Um, my organization supports other engineering teams across the organization. And what we found was it was critical um, you know, to, you know, we, had to, we had to build for the enterprise, right? 
support what made our company successful as a whole, make sure the right capabilities, security, guardrails, these things were in place. But it became equally as critical to uh, listen to our, our customers as other engineering teams, right? And to sit down and say, you know, what is it about the way we approach providing AWS to you that means that is somehow hindering your ability, right? And so we begin to iterate internally, right? Um, changing how we approach managing certain controls, changing how, um, how we provide access into AWS accounts, right? Um, and getting that feedback, iterating them, iterating with them like it's a product, right? Um, when we started to do that and we started to build a network, you know, through the organization, through these teams, um, that's when we really got the, the wheel to start turning, right? Um, and I think that, that change in thinking to treat it like a product and treat, treat it as something that must be iterated on to be successful was um, when, our, when our migration really started getting moving. Right. Yeah. Um, as a tools organization, right, to, to, you can't build a thing that's sort of like an ivory tower that nobody's going to use, right? As somebody that has been through and has seen a lot of customers do kind of failed cloud migrations or the, or the previous generation of private cloud and things like that, right? Where it's like hand over something that, that the developers can, actually can't use and that's not doesn't actually help um, in the end. Um, so we here at PagerDuty just released a study that IDC did for us uh, on the business value of digital operations management, uh, digital operations management platform like ours. You can find a copy of that on our website. Uh, and what I want to hear from you, uh, Mark, is just sort of examples of some of the value that you've been able to realize from PagerDuty. Like, how does that translate into dollars and cents for you? Yeah. You know, uh, when I think about going back before we had these kind of tools, right, and I talk about... Um, you know, the, it seemed like the objective was to, to manage the rotation in spreadsheets, mm -hmm. right? Um, or whatever it was. What it, what it didn't allow us to do is look back, right? And see how much time are we spending on these things, right? How much are we interrupted every day, every week, every night, right? Um, and how much is that detracting from our ability to deliver new products, new features, and innovate? Um, you know, when we, when we brought that in, it, it gave us a starting point um, to be able to measure, you know, things like MTTR, how frequently are our engineers, inter you know, interrupted in the middle of the night or interrupted during a, a work week, right, which takes them away from the stories that they're developing. Um, and... You know, one of the things recently that we've talked about is measure first, right? And when you measure first, it's often not starting from a good place, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't look good when you first look at it. But then it gives you the opportunity to start improving, right? Um, and I think that uh, the conscious efforts that, you know, in initiatives, um, in particular in, uh, in our Mannheim organization, where, you know, they were struggling to uh, even quantify how often they were being interrupted. They had a sense, a strong sense that, you know, there were, there were issues because it felt like they were always on fire, mm -hmm. right? But they didn't really quantify it, and then they didn't really start the, the cycle of improving that. Um, you know, and a lot of the work that, that we've done together and, uh, you know, the, the metrics of improvement that we've shared, um, you know, between Cox Automotive and PagerD are really about some of those initial Mannheim experiments and the intentional cycle of improving. Right, great. Um, you know, one of the other pieces of value, I think you touched on it briefly, is around, you know, when you make these improvements, it's not about getting rid of people, it's about like what opportunities can you, can you pursue, right? What innovation does that unlock for you? What innovation does adopting the cloud unlock for you? You know, and could you talk a little bit about some of the cool like customer and user projects and things like that that Cox Automotive Automotive's been able to build in the cloud as a result of some of these efficiencies? Um, sure. Um, so whether, you know, it is the, uh, you know, the process of, of buying a car, right, or it is the process of, you know, sort of the back office of, you know, uh, bringing cars into the auction, right, um, AWS has opened up a whole new style of, of engineering and opportunity, right? Um, 
to go from you know, web application development to being able to leverage a service like AWS IoT, right? And start doing things like image recognition of vehicles. One of the, the common challenges uh, that we deal with within the auctions is, you know, as a vehicle comes in and a set, we need to assess um, you know, any damage on that vehicle. That's people doing that work, mm -hmm. right? Um, to be able to add tools to their tool belt, um, whether it's through uh, you know, robotics and image recognition, um, machine learning to identify common types of uh, damage on vehicles, um, we enhance their ability to be more effective and to deliver more, right? But what we've, what we've learned is, is you know, all these uh, ideas of monitoring and performance metrics uh, and being responsible for those um, is equally as applicable in the web application world as it is in the physical world, right? And so we monitor uh, everything, not just the web applications, but we monitor the physical auction locations. We look for signals from you know, failing batteries. Is the generator running correctly, right? Um, and, and take action on those things. The AWS has provided us um, really new and interesting technologies to reach from the, the digital world into the physical world. Whereas that, you know, in the past when we've done that type of innovation, it comes with a high overhead and a high infrastructure to enable that type of thing. Right. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, and then finally, I just kind of want to mention that you folks were one of the, the launch partners with us for the integration with, uh, between PageDuty and AWS EventBridge. So maybe you could describe just a little bit about what you folks were able to do with AWS EventBridge. Well, um, if folks aren't familiar with AWS EventBridge, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how you sure. hooked it into Lambda and what you were able to achieve as a result of that integration. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when you approached us about EventBridge with AWS, we were really excited. Um, what EventBridge does is take the concept of event-driven architecture that's been so popular with Lambda um, and in other parts of our, you know, our systems design, which has always been contained inside the AWS world, right? EventBridge brings that out outside of AWS and it brings in the opportunity to communicate with partners like PagerDuty. Right, and uh, you know, if you check out EventBridge, it, you know it's not just PagerDuty. There's a whole list of other partners that have integrated with EventBridge. So now I can take the event-driven programming model and interact between PagerDuty and AWS. Um, you know, just sort of kicking the tires when we were getting started with it. We were saying, okay, this is this is amazing, but what can we do with it? What can we practically do with it? And we built a prototype um, that to help enhance our ability to respond to incidents. Um, so normally PagerDuty we think of as sort of a one-way signal source, right? Uh, it is, you know, information come, monitoring information comes into PagerDuty, uh, an inc incident is created and people start responding and that's the end of the story, mm -hmm. right? Um, but now that incident creation itself is an event that I can program against, right? So on the creation of that incident, um, we trigger a Lambda. We see what service that's coming from in PagerDuty, and we go and retrieve runbook information, right? A any kind of metadata that we want to gather about the service. Uh, you know, in our example, we just pulled, um, you know, some instructions on, you know, common issues with this service, how to respond to it. And then we leverage the PagerDuty API to call back into PagerDuty and post that information right back into the notes in the incident. So as that responder is getting that page, at the same time, automation is working in the background to bring him information about how best to respond to this incident, what, to my, what they might look for, you know, who's the SMEs on this topic, um, whatever they need to customize and to provide that responder notes at two in the morning, mm -hmm. right? Um, we can now use Lambda as a programming model to extend the capabilities of PagerDuty. Um, that can go that much farther to say that, um, you know, we may not just be posting information back into the ticket, we might be taking actions on systems, right? If I can, if I can make an API call, then I can, uh, I can interact with uh, auto-scaling groups, I can interrogate those EC2 systems and see what issues they might be having. Um, I can, uh, you know, even initiate a failover if I've, if I've made that something I can do programmatically. 
Right, and it can be also from that person's mobile device or what have you, if necessary. Right. right, and it's not just the initial incident creation. All of the activities that happen around the incident in PagerDuty become events that we can trigger additional actions off of. Right, great. Um, so since we have a little bit of time left, Mark, um, I kind of wanted to end a little bit on a random question, which is, you know, how do you hire talent at Cox Automotive and sort of position it as a great place to work, given that, you know, you have a lot of competition for engineering talent is so, so, uh, so fierce out there. And a lot of folks maybe coming out of school or starting earlier in their career are like, I don't want to work for an old company. I want to work for some Silicon Valley darling or whatever, right? <laughs> so, you know, what makes it cool and how do, how do you pitch and how do you think about hiring folks? We'll hang out with you guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, hiring is probably one of the, the most important things that we do at Cox Automotive is, is building the team and the culture. Um, you know, it, it is a much older company. Um, and I think some of the benefits that, uh, you know, people may not realize and may not look for is, um, you know, a company that has that history has learned to build a, a culture that cares for its individuals, that, uh, you know, creates a place where um, they can explore a whole career, right? Um, you know, when you take a job at, at, a, at a place, you think, this is what I'm doing while I'm here, and if I want to do something else, I have to leave, mm -hmm. right? Um, the Cox family is so large, and even amongst the diversity within just Cox Automotive, the ability to pursue anything from, the, you know, the web application space to, um, you know, physical infrastructure to, you know, in the, in the real world with the auctions, mm -hmm. um, means that there's a lot of different opportunities, right? And showing people the opportunity to, to explore that through, through a long amount of time, right? It makes it a uh, type of organization where you, you start to really build a career. Um, helping people see that, helping people understand that um, means that you know, you're working with these people for a long time, right? And it means that it's really critical that we hire for um, building uh, strong teams and a strong organization, um, you know, building diverse teams that, that we can learn from, bringing, you know, when, we, when new people come in, they see that we are learning as much from that new person coming in as they are learning from us, um, and introducing new ideas and new thoughts into the way we approach engineering. Um, we, we wear that on our sleeves in the interview, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we have that conversation with them. And I think that, uh, you know, that transparency is appealing to the type of people that we want at Cox Automotive, right? If that appeals to them, they're probably a good fit for our organization. Um, and so, you know, we value our individuals and our people and for what they bring to the organization and, and, and hire relentlessly. <laughs> yeah, and helps to have resources too, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, just with this event bridge thing, an example of that is just like there's cutting edge innovation too in, in, in large companies that have those resources, right? So great, I'd like to open it up uh, for folks who have, might have questions about, uh, about this topic. If you could just uh, step to the microphone. Yeah, we have some microphones some here microphones. and here. Yeah. Hi, sorry, I'm yeah. very short. <laughs> Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, the question I had is you mentioned you had thousands of engineers and hundreds of teams. How do you manage to keep the information about which people are associated with which team to which services up to date? Um, that is a really hot topic right now within our organization. Um, it is, you know, formally called information architecture and we're not good at it right now. <laughs> um, we're learning. Um, one of the one of the approaches that we're experimenting with right now and has been successful, because this problem exists beyond PagerDuty, right? It exists in every other tool that you use. It exists in just basic reasoning about how big is your organization? Is your, effect, is your organization designed effectively? Um, and the, the, you know, in our industry, when we, when we look at models like um, Scrum, right? It creates organizational structures that don't match what's in your HR system, right? Um, we have internally approached this by treating it like a data problem, right? We have built a data model 
that is sort of a orthogonal model to our, to our HR model, right? And it models our actual uh, agile structure, right? And we apply the same sort of uh, generalized concept beyond just our engineering teams doing our more formal agile program. We do a form of scaled agile framework, um, which has scrum teams organized into release trains and delivery streams and portfolios. And it's really teams of teams of teams, basically. Uh, we model this information. And the key was, uh, who owns the information? We've turned this information uh, ownership over to the local teams, right? And has it worked? In some regards, yes, and in some regards, no, right? There's, no, there's not a lot of drivers today to keep that information updated. But as we do things like uh, make our configuration inside PagerDuty dependent on that uh, central information architecture, right? Uh, and then the next step that we're going to work on is you know, synchronizing these things and, and keeping them to be mirrors of it and being able then to reason about, well, this team owns this PagerDuty service and this team owns this uh, New Relic application that they're monitoring, right? These are the same thing. We can start to make assertions and reasoning about that. We hope that that will drive more reason as we build more things around it for teams to want to maintain that data. Today, it's actually maintained fairly well, but occasionally we find aged data in there that hasn't been well maintained. So it's a work in progress. It is not one that, that we've solved by any stretch yet. So in an organization of your size, supporting as many systems as you do, I'm sure there's tons of different incidents, big and small, all day long, right? Yeah. Um, how do you approach and like what's your process like for taking those and triaging them, setting like priorities and making sure you're not pulling off engineers to handle maybe a low priority incident and if there's any ways that PagerDuty helps you do that, but like what's your process for that? So we, uh, as you know, this is a, I would say a joint exercise, right, between our enterprise operations center and those local teams, right? The, these local teams are, um, you know, people, some people, sometimes people will say first responders. I'd say we respond together, right? But they are there on the front lines, right along with the ESC in many cases, right? And we make, we focus really on, you know, the customer impact. Um, part of the ESC is what we call our major incident management team, right? And they, you know, they have that eagle eye view, right, of what is happening at any given moment as it relates especially to incidents across the organization. And that small team works together when these incidents coincide to see is there a relationship between these incidents? Um, is, are the right people focused on the right incidents? Do we need to make priority decisions? Um, the reality is um, it's not frequent that we have uh, major incidents cross organization that coincide with each other. It, it does happen, there are bad days. There's a, a member or, or two of the EOC in the audience and he knows it. Um, but uh, when it comes to prioritizing locally, right, we lean on that local team to have ownership in that space to drive their local prioritization, right? The practice, you know, it's not a, a tooling feature, but the core practice of an incident commander, right, is really critical to making sure we're responding with the right level of intensity to an issue or in the reverse, not <laughs> over responding, right? Um, so in a little bit, I feel like I've given you an answer, non-answer there. Um, you know, we leverage priority levels um, and we leverage uh, visibility and, and people whose role is to see and look for those coordination issues. Hi. So uh, I was wondering how, uh, what kind of integrations do you do with PagerDuty? Uh, first part of the question. And second part, do you use something like ServiceNow um, and, you know, do anything after, you know, the, the event aggregation and correlations that has, had, mm -hmm. has happened? 
And the first question was, do we, what integrations do we use with, with PagerDuty services? Right. You know, yeah. like Slack, Jira. Or, right, so. Okay. Um, so to sort of, I'll probably walk through the, the full sort of way we manage um, tools that relate to PagerDuty. Um, there are probably two major ways today, and this is, this is something we're iterating on, um, where information turns into action. All right. Um, locally, uh, an engineering team, you know, who's the owner of an application, uh, will monitor their application with a, you know, with some type of tool like New Relic, and they might also have custom checks that they write and send directly into the PagerDuty API on that same service. Um, but you know, the team is, uh, the, you know, they own that sort of localized monitoring of that service, right? It, it drives their needs and their response process. And so um, you know, they have direct ownership of that service within PagerDuty and therefore the ability to add those integrations to it. And that's one of the you know, real benefits we've seen in PagerDuty is just the, the underlying mental model of who owns the service, what are the permissions around that service does empower our teams in the way we want to see them empowered. Um, so locally, where that monitoring is really uh, specialized and tied to that application, those local teams monitor it, right? And then they can determine when to engage the EOC into that incident, right? Especially in many cases, those things like you know, that hard drive is full, doesn't mean that the customer is impacted, right? And so they, they run their local incident response and may not raise to that major incident level, right? But we always, but in the, the value that we've gotten recently as the, as the EOC has joined us inside PagerDuty is the ability to leverage a response play that says, well, yes, the, the alert went off that, that, this, that this disk is full, and we're, we have a blind spot that means there is a customer impact happening here. And it's only one click in a response play to bring the EOC into that incident and make it, uh, you know, create more awareness and maybe eventually make that a major incident. Um, the other way that information comes in is, uh, you know, our, our EOC provides monitoring onto our applications uh, in many times from the outside. They can consume our same New Relic feeds, um, but they may also monitor us with synthetic testing, right? And they are often more focused in, on the business KPIs, the, you know, the availability of a website, the ability to complete a, a, a sales transaction, right? And they work through, uh, through that monitoring information that they are also receiving. So we sort of have a, a, a good, a healthy check and balance to make sure we don't miss something either direction. Mm -hmm. um, and then to your other question, they're able to use the ServiceNow integration in PagerDuty um, and open a ServiceNow incident tied to the right assignment group and, uh, and eventually we're gonna be using uh, the CMDB to pick which PagerDuty escalation policy and service to then reach out to that team, right? And that cycle between the ServiceNow integration uh, and, uh, and PagerDuty itself and these coming at the monitoring from two different angles gives us quite a lot of visibility and then very low friction ability to interact with each other and share information. So I held back on my question because I thought maybe it was answered and then maybe it wasn't answered. So tell me a little bit more about um, how you incorporated your EOC into the PagerDuty um, lineup or giving them the visibility uh, into what's happening. You know, there's a disk full, maybe it's impacting, maybe it's not. How, like, how does that work for you? Let me, let me preface it with, you know, this, you know, this last part of it that I talked about as the EOC is coming into PagerDuty, um, you know, with the help of the PagerDuty team who's, who's fantastic through this migration. Um, has been in the last, you know, planned over about the last six months and I'd say executed in the last three or four. Um, and so we took a very intentional first step, right? Um, and the first step was to replicate um, a lot of the same workflows that they have today, the routing of monitoring, um, the uh, evaluation 
by EOC team members to determine, you know, this, this signal, this information coming in, does it warrant action, right? Um, and as we move them in, the thing that we did at the same time was enable the ServiceNow integration because that was their process was to, uh, to open that ServiceNow incident as sort of the, the uh, system of record of, it, of an incident happening and organize around that. And at the time, we're leveraging other tooling um, to you know, swivel chair and then reach out to teams. Right? We looked at that process end to end and said, well, We've got three or four swivel chairs in here. Let's see if we can get to two or three, right? Um, and so that integration uh, between PagerDuty and ServiceNow, we launched at the same time that the EOC came into, uh, into PagerDuty. And that meant that that workflow where that information comes in, it's evaluated by a member of the EOC and then determined who to reach out to. That who to reach out to became automatic, right? which does things like cut down those minutes and where minutes matter, right, in trying to figure out who is the right person to reach out to, right? How do I go from ServiceNow and then find a corresponding thing in PagerDuty um, and maybe they're named a little bit differently? That is not the, pro the case, right? Because this integration gives us hard linkage at the ID level and we can track the relationships between ServiceNow groups and PagerDuty escalation policies, it means that you know, as soon as they open that incident, a few seconds later, a pager is going off over here at a team across the country, right? The next iterations of this will be to include the CMDB, right? The CMDB models the what we build, right? The groups model who builds it, right? And this sort of gets back to that information architecture. Um, we actually have the, you know, the architect who's been focused on this problem here today. Um, and, you know, working working through the organization, we're starting, we don't have, honestly, a good map of who we are and what we build, right? Now we're starting to capture the what we build in the CMDB, right? And we'll be able to associate that logically to PagerDuty services. And that'll be the next step. And what that'll do is it'll take that value stream in that EOC and turn it from who should I call to what is having the problem and allow the teams to determine when this is having a problem, we've said, here's how you reach us and respond to that. And that takes that value stream down, you know, one more link in the chain, right? And, and that's that, you know, I, I talked earlier on about the sort of the iteration and the improvement. Um, you know, strong personal beliefs that I have is that uh, organizational transformation is not a big leap. It's a whole lot of little tiny steps. Right, um, and so bringing them in, so we started simple, um, and we're growing through it right now. If anyone else has it figured out, I'd love to talk to you after. <laughs> Great, any other questions? All right, well, uh, thank you so much for coming. I hope you had a good reinvent, uh, and everyone enjoy the party tonight. Have fun. Safe travel home. <laughs>